All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we've got Mitchell Whitfield on, I was going to say line again, it keeps tripping me up because I'm usually talking. It to is, people it is a form of line. It is a yeah, line. I mean, it, it, yeah, back in the day, uh, most of these kids don't know about dial up. So it used to be a line. You'd have to sit here and wait 45 minutes for a pixelated picture to come in. But that's neither here nor there. When I started this podcast, welcome to the What's in My Head podcast, guys. Uh, when I started this podcast, it was originally just about the turtles. I'm a huge, I mean, Ninja Turtles there. It's it's disgusting when you look in my room and see all the Ninja Turtle shit I got. Um, it started out just as that. But when I started digging deeper, you were in My Cousin Vinny. I was. One of my favorite, you have no idea how many times I've seen this movie. I, whenever I deployed, as in the Navy, so whenever I deployed, I always had my binder full of DVDs. Dude, we hit my cousin Vinny at least twice a month because everybody in my shop, everybody in my division, we loved this movie. Um, and you got to you get to work with probably the most beautiful woman in Hollywood, Marissa Tomei. Absolutely. How, how was that entire process, man? We'll get to turtles later, but how was that entire no, process? No, I appreciate it. And first, number one, thank you for your service. That's first and foremost. Um, uh, it was incredible. It was incredible. It was one of those experiences and, and not just because of what the, what the movie became, but it was my, I think it was my second big Hollywood movie that I had done. Um, and just one of those things where you read a script and you get to read, especially as a young actor, this was a long time ago, right? So yeah. I was mid twenties when I, when I first read that script and let's say I'm not anymore, mid fifties <laughs> now, uh, I can still say mids. I think I'm in one of the last years of my mid fifties. And I looked at that script and I fell in love with it. And I went through the process of auditioning. And originally when I auditioned for the role, I had moved out here from New York mm -hmm. and I'd been out here for maybe less than a year out in Los Angeles where I am now. And when my agent told me about the gig, they said, yeah, you know, they, they really, they're looking for a New York actor for this. And I'm like, uh, I, I am a New York actor. I just moved out here less than a year ago. Well, they're really looking for a New York actor. I said, I, like, I am a New York actor. So it was very funny to get them to see me originally when they wanted an authentic New Yorker, which I am. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I ended up going through the audition process. I had to fly to New York to test for it, to screen test. And then they made me wait to the last, you know, they, they, when you sign a screen test deal, you have two weeks. They have two weeks to let you know. And they waited to the last minute of the last day. And I finally found that I was so excited. And the movie, uh, just those relationships becoming really close with Ralph Macchio and seeing it, I, you, you know, you say, you know, you guys pulled it out, you know, once a month to, or once or twice a month to watch that movie. I think it's on at least twice a week somewhere in the country, probably many times a day, everywhere in the world. I had no idea at that time it would turn into that. But I guess I'm very lucky when you talk about like iconic things like my cousin Vinny, being a turtle, being on Friends, being a Transformer. I got really lucky. I was on like four things that, you know, these four timeless franchises, I got really lucky. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you like it. I had a blast making that movie. When that movie, when I first saw that movie, so my grandpa is, he's, he's, he's been gone for a while now, but he was the best and the worst influence on me when it came to movies. Uh, he showed <laughs> me, he showed me my first Steven Seagal movie, you know, oh uh, above the law, he's snapping his arm over, over the shoulder. Um, we actually saw, you brought Ralph Macchio, we, we saw the Karate Kid, and he was one of those, he was an old timer that liked to play and pull pranks, and uh, it was the scene where Daniel son was doing the crane kick, right, and he's like, I bet you can't get up on the couch and do that, and I was like, I bet you I can, so I do it, and he had a pillow holstered back here behind him, he had cock locked and ready to rock, and as soon as I go to switch my legs, he caught me with the pillow, I tumbled off, hit the, hit the table, start crying because I'm only a few, you know, I'm only like seven or eight at the time, hit my head on the table. And uh, I was, a, I was a chunky kid. He's like, shh, shh, don't tell your grandma Juanita, you're going to get us both in trouble. I'll get you a pizza <laughs> and we'll watch something else if you be quiet and you stop crying. So instantly tears dried up, pizza came, we watched some more movies and it just happened to be my cousin Vinny was on, it was uh, AMC, not AMC, it was back when AMC was doing actual movies or TMC, one of those things. Right, right, right. Um, so I had seen it, seen it that way. And uh, one of my favorite scenes are when you guys are in the convenience store and then you're talking him out of a can of what tuna, I believe. You're paying um, for advertising, yeah. You're paying for advertising, man. Um, was any of that stuff off the cuff or was that all scripted or how'd that work? Most of it was scripted. I remember, I will say there were some off the cuff moments. Mm -hmm. um, the one that stands out, that was, first of all, I believe it was Dale Lawner. Um, wrote an incredible script, uh, great. It was a great script, uh, just the book as it was, the script as it was, was great. 
there were some improvised moments. One that I remember pretty strongly was when we were sitting in court for the first time mm -hmm. and we're introduced, you know, uh, she introduces Ralph and she's like, and Stanley Rothenstein. <laughs> and I remember just being upset sitting there. It's like, here we are on trial for our lives. And she's getting my friggin' name wrong. If you're going to put, put us through this misery, at least get my name right. So I just turned to Ralph. I was like, she said, she said, Steen, uh, Rothenstein, it's Stein, uh, Rothenstein, not Steen, not Stein. And I got very upset that she didn't say Rothenstein. I said, Steen, not Stein. And he's like, shut up. And it was totally improv moment. and ended up making it into the movie. Um, awesome. And then when we were in the prison cell for the first time, when we go to jail, and I, I'm, of course, very nervous. And by the way, yeah. Lee Arendale Correctional Facility outside of Atlanta, Georgia, where we shot that movie, they didn't remove the prisoners. They were all still there. Jesus Christ. Saying things that I you <laughs> would not want repeated, even on the, the freedom of a podcast, you would not want to repeat it. Um, and I remember, you know, being very nervous, you know, as myself in that situation. And then we do the scene for the first time we get led into the cell. And I said, like, you know what happens in these places? He said, what? You know, and then some big guy named Bubba. Yeah, said, that was not that was not in there either. And I remember the director saying to the producer, uh, Bubba, is that funny? The producer's like, yes, it's, it's funny. Leave it alone. It's fine. And so that made it into the movies, too. But uh, yeah, there were some really fun improvisational moments. But I can only take credit for a couple of them because some of them were other people's moments. And then, like I said, Dale Launer wrote an incredible script. So a lot of that was actually on the page. We were we were super lucky, which is why, like I said, I kind of fell in love with it when I read it for the first time. I mean, it's 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 one of those movies like you see with some of these movies from 20, 30, even shit five years ago. Right. Some movies just don't hold up regardless of it. And this one is I don't give a shit what anybody says, man. This thing is a timeless classic. This will go down as one of the greatest movies ever made, at least for me. And like I said, I'm always break. I can't wait. Uh, I tried showing it to my kid, which I don't think there's anything too crazy. Um, I dropped you know. some F-bombs, but just a couple of times. Yeah, I mean, he, he's 10. So I think he's, we just showed him, uh, if, you, if you got a Netflix subscription, check this one out. It's uh, Vampires versus the Bronx. It just came on TV like last week. Fan oh, okay. Fantastic movie. It's about kids. And really? It's, they're, they're taking the gentrification of the Bronx and they're making it about vampires by white dudes that like macchiatos and tight jeans and flannel shirts. So it's oh, wow. fantastic. It's a great movie. It's a good time. Check um, it out. Yeah, so I think if my kid can watch that, I think he can get away with uh, my cousin Vinny. I, I was way go younger. There, especially if, go ahead. If, if dad can handle being flipped over a table at his age, then, you know, <laughs> I think you're okay. You would think, man. I mean, I saw a Casino and I saw Goodfellas. I wanted to be in the Mafia when I was younger because they always got go. to eat pasta and they were always playing cards or dominoes. And I thought that was really cool. Up until I see if Joe that's Pesci. That's it was, yeah. <laughs> until Joe Pesci's just beating somebody's head in with a baseball bat. And I'm like, oh shit, this stuff's for real. And I don't yeah. want to be in this group anymore, you know? <laughs> so. Oh my God. Yeah. No, uh, I, uh, like I said, I, I, I do think when I look back, just a great fun movie. And you know, what's really weird. And a lot of people don't realize this. And, you know, I think it happened really, well, maybe at that time, but it also happened a lot afterwards, but that movie was like two hours and 20 minutes long, which for a comedy yeah. is really long. Because, mm -hmm. you know, most comedies, you think about it between an hour and 40, hour and 15, hour and 15 minutes. They, they usually comedies have different pacing to them than an action movie, yeah. or, than a love story does. So there's a certain quickness and, you know, the cuts have a nice pace to them. And this one was a really, and it, when you watch it, you don't think, oh, I don't think it has moments where you're sitting there for 20 minutes saying, I wish this would end, but it's two hours and 20 minutes. So yeah. to capture the audience's attention at, at, at that length of a film for a comedy is also saying something, you know? Yeah. I mean, they when you go back and look, it was always like you were saying that 95 minute, because whenever I'd look on the back of a DVD or VHS at the time, boys and girls, this was a little thing you put into a VCR. We'll talk about that at a later date. Um, and then you'd rewind it. Right. And then you'd always right. see that magic, especially with movies. I'd want to say from the nineties to, to at least 2000, 2001, at least my memory, it might be fucked up, but it's either neither <laughs> here nor there, but that 96 minute mark is what you would always see. I'd always say approximate right. and then 96 minutes. And it was crazy because it doesn't feel like two hours. Like you're just sitting there. It's a nice movie to veg out to. Every scene means something. There's no filler in there. It's fantastic. That's, so. that's, that's how I feel too. And you know, what's funny is, you know, and for your listeners and the people watching, 
that don't know this really the timing of it became a movie theater thing because mm -hmm. again when most movies were consumed in a theater and i hope we get back to that again really soon yeah. for many reasons more than more as a viewer than a person that makes them because i just love going to the movies but yeah. um you know there was that certain time length where they knew they could get a certain amount of showings in and have the most people in the movie theater making the most money on concessions so they wanted the shorter films so that they can get more showings in per day yeah. which meant more money for everybody especially you know the people that ran the theater so that became a thing so a comedy that ran 220 you think about it, the fact that it made as much money as it did when it did not getting as many showings in a theater as a comedy usually does that again kind of speaks volumes i'd like to say it's because of what i did but we all know that's not true <laughs> i just wanted to be like yeah you know i i carried that film very well i can't even joke about that but no it was yeah it was long but it, it worked and the pacing of it was really great when when that movie came out and you got the script and you guys were shooting it, how long had you have how long had you been doing the acting gig for that long or for for that amount of time, I guess? So I started doing voice work, which I still do today, and which will seg segue us nicely mm -hmm. into TMNT. I started doing voice work when I was about thirteen or fourteen. Okay, so that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, your mid teens doing... is that what you're saying? What what? Your mid teens is that what you're saying? My yeah, exactly. My mid-teens. If we're going to go with the mids, let's go with the mids. Exactly. Sorry, that was right. You remember. Thank you. Um, and then I started doing theater a little after that. I didn't start doing movies till I was maybe 17 or 18. And then I didn't move out to Los Angeles, which is I really, when I started pursuing uh, full-time, because I knew in New York, this is what I wanted to do. I was my third year in college. I was playing hockey, as academic stuff. And then I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to take a year off from school, go to New York, figure out what I want to do. And then I got cast and the traveling company of uh, Brighton Beach Memoirs, a big Neil Simon play where I went all over the country with that. And then by the time I was like 23, 24, I was like, you know what? If this is what I'm going to do, I have to go to the place where they're doing more of it. And that was yeah. Los Angeles. New York was great. A lot of film, obviously a lot of theater, a lot of film and television, but you're always limited by the number of studios New York had, which is not as many as the ones in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you were limited in shooting outdoors in New York. So that's why I came out here. And then by the time I was 25, we moved out. And I guess within a few months, I got my first feature film, which was Dogfight, a Warner Brothers movie. And then yeah. uh, it was like six months after that, after I came back, that I got my cousin Vinny. So I had been acting up until then for a while, but hadn't moved to Los Angeles, you know, for, except for a year before and had done some smaller stuff. Then came Dogfight, then came my cousin Vinny. So so did when, when you guys were shooting, did any of, because I mean, Joe Pesci's Joe Pesci. Um, but did any of the guys that had been on, you know, for some time or had gotten some pictures under their belt, did they, you know, put their arm around you and give you any advice or did they tell you what you're really looking for? Or was that all you? Uh, you know, the director, Jonathan Lynn was our director. Jonathan Lynn was a great guy and great director and a really good guy. Mm -hmm. And he sort of took me under his wing a little bit. Um, and I really loved the process as I have a feeling you probably do as well. The process of filmmaking, what, you know, what makes <laughs> how movies are made. I think people would yeah. be really interested to see that, you know, filmmaking is incredibly boring on a daily <laughs> basis, uh, the day-to-day -day of it. But then once you get the shots, once you shoot the scenes, there's so much magic that's made inside the editing room. And I think that's what Jonathan Lynn, the director, gave to me, which was letting me see what the camera saw. Yeah. Because as an actor, you're used to being in your space and doing your thing. And actors can become can become very self involved. I don't know if you notice this. There's some actors that are very selfish and self involved. I know that's an incredible concept. I've met a right? few of them, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah. you know, as an actor, you, you're used to your space, what you're doing, your performance. So Jonathan Lynn showed me the other side. He showed me. He said, "Okay, you're doing what you're doing, especially as a as a theater actor. Before I was doing film and television, you're used to having these big performances, but the camera, you know, is a microscope. It amplifies everything that you do. So." Yeah. The second we started shooting, after the app, basically the way the filmmaking works for, again, for people that don't know, regardless of whether you're shooting on location or shooting where you're editing the movie in the same city, you watch dailies. So you shoot a movie, then the next day you shoot more stuff, then they send you the stuff that you shot yesterday so you can review it. And you yeah. start editing it along the way. So basically the editing process starts right away. The editor is there where you're ever you're shooting the movie and he's piecing together those dailies, those pieces that came in from the day before shooting. And they start doing like a rough assembly of the movie. So every day, Jonathan Lynn would take me into the editing room and show me what the camera was seeing mm -hmm. and show me how the piecing together of the movie really worked, which was invaluable, yeah. not just as an actor, but knowing the entire process. And I think 
knowing the entire process, knowing what everything, what the lighting crew, the designers, uh, you know, makeup, the gaffers, what everyone is doing in harmony to make this movie, knowing what everyone's doing really helps us do what we do. Yeah. So anyone that thinks, you know, you go in, just do your thing and ah, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm the actor. <laughs> There's so many people that make the movie what it is. And I learned that process from him. And that to me was sort of the version of, hey, let me take you under my wing and show yeah. you. It was like showing me the bigger picture of filmmaking, which was incredible. And I think, you know, kind of served me well from that point on. When you got to see all of the, because obviously you would see the stuff in the dailies that didn't make or did make it in the film. <laughs> Uh, when you're thinking back and you're looking at this, what is your favorite scene that didn't make it in? And what was your favorite scene that made it in, whether it was your scene or whoever's scene? Wow, that is tough. Um, favorite thing that made it in and how could it not make it in was Austin Pendleton, who played my lawyer, mm -hmm. my stuttering attorney, <laughs> um, who was, first of all, one of the sweetest men in the world, yeah. the sweetest, sweetest guy around, and also incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and watch that movie, again, which I know you will, oh, because yeah. you were you and you love the movie, which I love. <laughs> you will see me when he is stuttering his way through that scene, banging on, you know, where the jury is and yeah. hitting the guy's shoulder, <laughs> the jury's shoulder, j j j and the camera turns around and you see me, shoulders <laughs> going. I don't think there was one clean shot of me not laughing in the background because I, it killed me. I even said to him when, you know, the camera was turned around watching him. When they're ready for my close up, so when the camera turned around to me and you weren't seeing what he was doing, you were just seeing my reaction, I took him aside. I was like, Austin, man, you're killing me. And I'm afraid that on my close up, if you do your performance, I'll start laughing. I won't be able to keep it together. So do me a favor. When the camera turns around to me and the camera can't see you, just, you know, mark where you walk around and, you know, just mark your spots where you are visually so my eye line will be correct. But don't do your full performance because I'll start to laugh. He's like, no problem. No problem. He was, we became friends. So it's uh, real speed and action. Ladies and gentlemen, and he started stuttering and making it bigger than ever just to get me. And I was like, you son of a bitch. I ask you one thing not to make me, and I just laugh and I, I could barely get through it. He just, he just killed me. Um, what didn't make it into the movie? Well, what some people might not know is um, back in the day, I think they still do it now. I haven't been traveling by airplane enough recently and watching a lot of movies on airplanes. Yeah. You a lot of times you'll do a separate version of a scene mm -hmm. for the airplane version, which they're very strict about in terms of profanity and sexual innuendo. So they sometimes rather than just dubbing stuff, which you do, you know, you do and you know, in post. Um, there was a version of the scene that we did for airplanes that was clean, very rated G, where Joe comes into the cell for the first time and I think he's there to molest me. I don't know that he's uncle, you know, uh, cousin Vinny. I think he's there to actually molest me. And he comes in for the first time and he's like, and he's yelling, he goes, you know, I, I forget it. Hell, I didn't come here to get jerked up. You know, they couldn't say that for the airplane version. So he said, I didn't come here to play patty cakes. <laughs> now being in a prison cell, I thought this was some prison game. It's yeah. like, look, I don't know what patty cakes is basically, but I don't want any part of this. <laughs> and even though it was, there was nothing profane in there, it was just, you know, they like, listen, I didn't come here to play patty cakes. I was very upset by this because look, I don't know what kind of prison patty cakes game you want to play, but I, I don't want to play it with you. And that version of it, even with nothing dirty, nothing, and just all clean language, the innuendo and the, like the, the strangest, the awkwardness of that scene, I thought played brilliantly and no one will ever see it unless they happen to see the airplane version which was actually very funny and very unusual. But sometimes when they change things up and you're forced to keep it clean, you get something that's even better and even funnier. So, I mean, I have a filthy mouth, so I didn't mind the cursing at all. Yeah. I enjoyed it. But uh, that the patty cake version of that prison cell scene, unless you were flying when that movie came out, you will never see. But it was hysterical. Oh, man, that, that, I, I didn't know. Like, I knew they would dub stuff because I would watch a movie on a plane. And then I'm like, ah, they forgot some stuff in here or they added some stuff here. So it was always interesting. I never knew that. You know, I figured that they might have changed some stuff up, but it's, it's nice knowing that now. And I'm going to have to write my congressman to see if I can't get that cut. <laughs> but uh, my, I want uh, my airplane version of the movies. <laughs> I demand. I, I deserve it. The, the, my, my two favorite parts in that entire movie is when him and Marissa, they're, they're trying to sleep. And it's whether it's the pig farm, the train, or the when owl. he goes the owl when he goes out to the cat he just starts firing off rounds 
end of the night. And then being a Southern guy, you know, I never liked cold breakfast. I didn't like bake. Like I like bagels, you know, to an extent, but I wanted bacon, eggs and grits. And my favorite <laughs> scene is what is a grit? And they're just picking it up. And then the, you, you could tell, like maybe he had eaten grits before then, but having so many people and being all around this world and seeing people when they get a bowl of grits, it is the most universal thing. And I don't know if this was, it's just inherent in people's nature when they eat a grit, but they all do the same thing Joe Pesci did. They picked it up, they smelled it and they would, what is this? And then they put it back. Yeah. And, and then you're just waiting and, and you know, it's, it's kind of evolved into, you know, people taking a picture with their phone, you know, but back then it was, you know, so it was, it's nice seeing that no, no matter what's changed in this world, how people eat grits is how Joe Pesci described a grit in this movie. You know? It was perfect, especially as a New Yorker, not growing growing up and not knowing what a grit was. I didn't have my I didn't have my first grit until I was in South Carolina when I was 23 or 24. I was driving cross country and we drove down. There are many routes to go. And I mean, I've driven cross country four times. God help me. That'll never happen again. Unless my son wants to do it. My daughter, then I do it. I had to, but. Um, so, you know, we took the Northern, the Midwest, uh, Southwest, then the purely South route. And mm -hmm. it was when we took the, the South route, the Southern route, we came basically down from New York and went through the Carolinas, uh, and then cut across, um, the lower U S and we went to this, uh, was it the log cabin? It was like a chain of diners in the South and they had, they had a country breakfast, a steak and eggs, uh, mm -hmm. a country, country fried steak. Yeah. Uh, eggs, grits, and the whole thing. And I was like, you know what? We have to do this right. That was back when my stomach could handle it. I mean, I feel like I need a diaper just talking about this, but um, which is it's very attractive here, I'm sure. So my first time, I was like, oh, these are, this is good. It's like cream of wheat, but better. It's not like, so I remember, so that's when he, by the way, his timing in that scene was perfect. Like you said, he's about to, he's like, what exactly is it? You know, I, the timing was great. The anticipation of it was wonderful. Um, but yeah, I, I, as a New Yorker, I, I don't know what the heck a grit was until I had my first one. I was like, this is fantastic. I wish more places in New York had grit. So yeah, it was great. Oh, it's, it's nice hearing that because you hear people like me. I never had oatmeal until I got to boot camp and there was nothing else to eat. And then I never had, you know, after that, I was like, oh man, oatmeal is not that bad. I mean, I still prefer grits. Oatmeal is not that bad, but you know, you can only eat so much oatmeal. I haven't eaten oatmeal since I got out of the Navy. It's just, it was one of those things like, ah, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I don't need to eat this. I can eat real food now. So uh, it's like salty awesome. spackle. It's pretty good though. I, I when, when it's the only thing you have, Yeah. Like I was just recovering. I actually had a knee replacement about four months ago. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I could stomach in the and I had to eat constantly to take the medication and stuff. So it was always, it was oatmeal and a piece of toast with like cheese on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that oatmeal is like, oh, if it's <laughs> the only thing you've got, it's fantastic. When there are other options, like, what the hell am I doing? This is oatmeal. What am I thinking? And you shove it to the side, but still, I'll still grab a bowl now and then. I'll if you don't mind me asking, would you have ACL, PCL, or what, what was done? Just full on knee replacement. My, uh, yeah. I've, uh, I played hockey for a long time when I was younger. Between that and not winning the genetic lottery in terms of my <laughs> bones and arthritis, uh, yeah, the whole knee had to go. I, ironically, it was my left knee that's been really bad, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the right knee went. I was like, I better get this taken care of because I want to be able to do stuff with my kids. And having, unfortunately, having you know COVID and having this time to actually do it and recover. I was like the first surgery in, in Cedars, Cedar sinai Hospital in, in Los Angeles, yeah. the first elective surgery once they reopened. I was like, get me in there. I got in there, I got the knee surgery, I got the replacement, came out. So now I, I, I'm i part bionic, along with being a turtle and many other things. I'm also part bionic, which I don't think the other turtles can actually say. So no, I mean, looking back on it, I mean, you've got metalhead. I don't know how deep you want to go with turtles. Like I said, I'm super fucking nerdy about this this franchise oh, i love it whatever you want to do whatever you um do. you know so i mean i think in the current series you know donatello did die um they brought him back you know they did the did you ever read batman back in the day or know anything yeah. about batman yeah so when bane broke batman's back breaking the bat that was the comic that was the cover breaking the man, bat good pull i appreciate that man see man you're a cool fucking guy already man look at this <laughs> i just went batman. through my collection and i still have it in plastic because i bought one to read and yeah. one to put away. Mm -hmm. And I just remember him over the knee mm -hmm. with that very dark, with a very yeah. dark style. And then was it the breaking of the bat? Was that the name of the, that particular one? Yeah, I think I got it right here. I think it was in the, uh, I've got the trade. Oh, there you know. go. Yeah, it's the Nightfall. And there, were, there was that, there was that, that's right. There was a whole Nightfall series. That's right. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we're talking turtles and my cousin Denny, <laughs> but go out of your way to check out that book. Fantastic. You got to show some love to other stuff. Yeah.
Yeah, man. Like any, like I said, this is why it started, like I said, with the turtle tapes was the name of the original podcast, but then I, I didn't want to get pigeonholed. I didn't want to get typecasted into one role because eventually turtle roles are going to run out. Or I get to the point where I'm trying to talk to the big guys, like the guys that do the movie and all this other stuff. And they just don't want to talk to a little guy like me just yet. However, when this whole thing turns around and this guy's the new face, the new Joe Rogan, but of pop culture media, I'm going to make sure I save all of these emails and say, Hey, remember this? I'll still have you on the show. No problem. But I want you to know, I want you to just come up and, you know, remember back when, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, but it, you know, it is what it is, but, uh, so Donnie died and Donnie came back. Um, and then, you know, he, I think he did a little, it's been a long time. I think it's been like 30, 40 issues at this point. It might've been a little bit later than that, but you know, he died, came back and then he, um, uh, metalhead was the, the fourth turtle for a little while. Um, but going back to turtles, how this movie was fantastic. This is one of the best movies, the TMT 2007, um, since that original nineties movie. And then it's by far the best one. Um, when it comes to anything other than that nineties movie, you got two, three, and then the two that Michael Bay did. How right. did this one come about? How did you get the call? Well, Galen Walker, the producer, uh, we actually were in, uh, a martial arts class together. Okay. We were taking ta Taekwondo together mm -hmm. and we were training and it was mostly for exercise. It wasn't so much for gaining belts. I mean, we got, we did that along the way, but it was mostly, you know, just two dudes trying to keep in shape. And we yeah. started talking. It's like, Hey, what do you do? And he didn't know I was an actor. And I started, I was like, Oh my God, of course I remember you from that. Uh, uh, do you do voice work? It was all, I was like, yeah, I've been doing voice work for a long time. So he's like, he's like, you know, I have this movie. That is really how it started. Cause I, most yeah. of my career stuff has started from my agent calling me and say, Hey, they want to see you for this or, you know, they're casting this and we're going to send you into me with that. That's how that normally starts normal Hollywood stuff. But this yeah. actually started as a real life connection with someone that I knew. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Oh, you do voice stuff. Oh, no. You know, we're doing TMNT. And, you know, I was like, Oh my God, that would be awesome. So I auditioned, ended up getting it. And, um, you know, the guys, the relationships, I think among the four of us, um, it was, it, it had to happen very quickly. Yeah, because, you know, we didn't have a ton of time in the studio together. And that's what people don't realize. First of all, we were able to actually record together as an ensemble, mm -hmm. which makes a huge difference, makes yeah. a huge difference, especially like a, like a table read or is that what you're talking well, yeah, about? Yeah, we were on an ensemble in the studio because a lot the way the, a lot of animation works now these days is especially because I think so much a lot of animated content is celebrity driven stunt casting a lot of that and a lot of time they can't get people on the same schedule. So they'll record people individually. They'll just do all of my lines or all of somebody else's lines by themselves sort of in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And yes, you get good performances out of that. You do, you see it every time you hear it every time you can yeah. get some good stuff out of that. But when you actually have the cast in the studio, everyone's mic'd up and reading it, like you said, like a teleplay that everyone's doing it together, the timing, the reacting off each other, ad libbing the yeah. stuff that you would never be able to get by having that recording in a vacuum sort of style. And it was so important that we were all there together at the same time. And you know, uh, James Arnold Taylor, Nolan North, Mikey Kelly, myself, we didn't really know each other that well beforehand. We mm -hmm. knew of each other from the acting world, from the voice world, we didn't know each other. So forming that bond so fast and getting yeah. that done so, you know, and having to, ha you know, forge that bond quickly uh, was pretty incredible. And it just, you know, by the time we were done with that first day recording, it was as if we had known each other for years. We were those guys, we were those four brothers. So it was, it was a blast the way that it came together and how quickly we bonded mm -hmm. through this project and over this project was amazing. Now, did you originally know you were going to, when he said, hey, man, I got this idea or I've got this movie to work on for the Turtles, did he come out and say, hey, you're going to be playing Donnie or hey, I want you to try out for Donnie or did you try all four Turtles? I think uh, I think I might have read for Mikey and Donnie. Mm -hmm. But I clearly, I mean, the funny thing is I'm such a, I'm such a tech head. I'm such a nerd myself. <laughs> I love technology. I love nerding out over it. Um, so for me, and also my vocal quality kind of lended itself that way anyway, toward, mm -hmm. I guess, what people thought of tra the traditional, you know, that Donnie kind of vibe. Yeah. So between that and my love of gadgets, it sort of was like a match made in heaven. I was like, yes, that is a turtle I should be. I will make that bow staff work. So it was, uh, it was really kind of cool. And I was just, you know, I always, my, my brothers, I, I have two younger brothers. Mm -hmm. um, one of them's, I guess, 14 years younger. The other is 23 years younger. Okay. So it's like pretty much generationally younger for me. Yeah. And they were, you know, TMNT fans. So for me to play that part for them was, you know, super cool. 
And for me, it was too, because I was, when I did this, I, and to this day, I mean, you can't see what my office is like. In fact, where I'm pointing up there, folks, mm -hmm. off camera, is where my talking Donatello doll is. And up here, all my Marvel action figures and board games. So when I say I'm geeking out, I'm not joking. Um, I, I, once I found out that I was Donnie, I was so, I was, for me, it was the perfect match. I yeah. couldn't have picked a better turtle for myself. Even though I, I think I, I laughed the most at Mikey when I was watching, mm -hmm. uh, I was definitely best suited to Donatello. So I was, man, I was thrilled. So I think I ended up auditioning for both, but uh, they, I think they picked me for the right one, especially because I think Mikey Kelly did such an incredible Michelangelo. I yeah. love, to me, he is Michelangelo. So it, it, it ended up working out perfectly. Well, hey, man, I mean, like I said, I'll, I'll do a quick, I usually don't do this, but like I said, it's going to be disgusting. So, see it. oh, there we go. But yeah, it's like every iteration that they've done. And then over here, I don't want to wrap up my cords, but uh, every iteration they've done, those, the ones at the top, my my wife actually got me those for, I walked in the comic book store and I still go every Wednesday to get my new comics. And I go in there and I see them and I'm like, oh shit. Those, I, I haven't seen those on a shelf before. Usually they were going for 150, almost 175 at that time, um, wow. Big Turtle. So I'm like, damn it. So I, I pull out my little stamp cards because they give you stamp cards when you go to the Comic Comic Central in Sanford, Florida. Go there. Great, fantastic people. Um, okay. Little spot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, little plug. There. I love it. Yeah, man. I always, I always like bringing up the people that have always treated me nice, man. You always got to bring everybody up. There's enough room and everybody to eat at the table. You just got to clear a little spot for everybody. I believe you. Um, I agree. But uh, they got, they see me and they're like, oh man, we got these turtles out there. We know your wife's going to stab us if you buy them. So she told us you can't buy them. And I'm like, God damn it. I was like, shit, I really wanted these turtles. And uh, so I've been going here for almost a decade now. Um, and so I go in there the next week and they're completely gone. I'm like, damn it. I had all the stuff that I needed to buy them. Um, Cause you, you, you fill up a stamp card and for every $8 you spend, you get a stamp and you fill up 10 stamps, you get $8 off of anything you want in there. So I always save uh, for an entire year or two on all my stamp cards, just in case there's something in there that's pricey and I want to buy it. Right. So I had enough where it wasn't going to be too bad of a hit. And I only might've gotten stabbed once by the wife. Right. Just like, one, that's, yeah, you could survive that. Roll the dice. Right. You know? So I figured, all right, well, we're going to sit here and roll the dice. I walk in, they're all gone. I'm like, damn it. And they're like, yeah, we know we sold them. What I didn't know was they sold them to my wife Your because wife. she called yep. before I got there. Um, <laughs> and she was like, Hey, take the turtles off the shelves. Tell them they sold. Um, and we're going to get them for him for Christmas. So don't tell them anything. And then oh, they're like, are you awesome. serious? Because you told us not to sell them to you last week. And she's like, I'm dead serious. Save these turtles. <laughs> so uh, and it was, it was cool, awesome. It was a cool, give me one second. It was a cool no, little, no, go for it. Cause I got a, I got another story. And like I said, we're talking turtles, right? So this is a cool another story. So my wife was super bummed and I knocked off a piece of this. My wife was super bummed that she didn't think that I, she got me the best gift for Christmas because I actually cried at this Christmas. Um, it's not like it's hard to make me cry. I see somebody that I've grown up loving for the my entire life. I'm like, oh my God, you're so great. Right. So I've told this story once before, but I'll tell it again. I'll make it quick. Um, so right. when I was a, when I was a little kid, my mom worked two jobs. My dad wasn't in the picture. Um, and then it was four or five of us. I can't remember because I think my older brother was out by that time. Um, but there was at least four of us and, uh, you know, working two jobs, single mom, and you got four or five kids, you know, oh, yeah. Christmas time, Thanksgiving time, all that stuff's tough. Um, all that stuff is tight. So there was always one gift I asked for every like birthday, Christmas, I always wanted. And like I said, I just knocked off a couple pieces there on the ground, but the original Turtle van oh, from the 1987 God. play series, right? Oh. So I asked, 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 and we, she could never make it happen. And I was never upset. I was always a very appreciative kid because I knew how hard my mom worked. And, uh, you know, flash forward to when 2012 and the new Turtles came out for Nickelodeon. My kid is two, maybe three at the time. And he is balls deep into Turtles, right? He loves them all. He's watched them all. We're bonding over Turtles, which is fantastic because... For a three-year-old, he would shit on every movie I would show him. I showed him the <laughs> '90s Turtles. He's like, "This is bullshit." Not, not literally, but he's, "I don't want to watch this. This is dumb. I want to watch cartoons." Right. right. So, we're we're in Target of all places, right? And then my mom's down visiting us, and then he's in the little seat, and they're talking back and forth. And then we get on the toy aisle, and I'm like, "Oh shit, here we go." My mom just spoiled the hell out of this kid. Every <laughs> single turtle toy is on the shelf, and she's literally just going scraping everything into. 
into the cart <laughs> and she goes and picks up and I've got, uh, I've got it around here somewhere. My kid actually gave it to me and told me to stop being a baby. Um, but uh, the, the new turtle van that they did for the 2012 series. And then oh, she wow. goes to pick it up and put it in. And a lot of this stuff was a lot cheaper. Like that turtle van was like a 50, 60 buck toy back then. Now oh, it's yeah. 23, $24, you know, for the new ones. And uh, she goes to pick it up and I look and I'm like, are you serious? And then she's like, what? And I'm like, listen, I love you, mom. You pushed me out of you. You gave me life. You gave me food. You did all this stuff for me. But there's one thing, one thing I'm going to hold over your head right now, because I'm going to be a little jealous. You're spending a lot of money on this kid right now that I've already spent. And I was like, you're getting a maternal band. That's the only thing I ever wanted. And then she looked, she looked at me, she looked at my son and she was like, will you share this with your dad? And he was like, yeah. So she's like, shut the hell up and let me do what I'm going to do. Right. So flash forward about four years later, this is 2016. I just get out of the Navy. Um, you know, so uh, we usually do this thing where we take pictures of everybody opening up their gifts, like most people do. Um, very rarely does, you know, it switch to video and everybody's recording. So I start seeing phones pop up like, you know, I'm a superstar and people right. record me, right? I'm like, what the hell's going on? I got this huge box. I'm the last person to open the gift. Right. So open it up and then on the top of the box, right? Um, Cause everything was bubble wrap. She put stuff over so I couldn't see into it was a note, handwritten note. And then just says my nickname and this, I'm going to get crucified for this. My nickname, my mom always called me was poo, right? Her little poo bear. Okay. So it said poo, stop your crying, stop your bitching. Love mom. <laughs> Happy, Merry Christmas. So I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then I open and I start moving stuff up. And then my hand goes to my mouth and I'll try not to cry, but my hand goes to my mouth. And I, instantly, yeah. I instantly start crying. I got goosebumps and stuff. And I'm calling her crying. I'm like, you're the best mom ever. I love you so much. <laughs> two, two weeks, I would come up here because we had a two-story house and I'd walk by and my room's over here and this is my office. Right. And I'd open the door real quick to make sure it wasn't a dream. And I was like, all right, it's still there. there? Close okay. it. And like for two or, three, two or three hours after, you know, Christmas festivities, uh... up, I'm upstairs, I'm playing with it. I've got my turtles. I've got my van. I felt like a damn kid again. It was the greatest. Don't you love it? Yeah. Well, and then my wife was like, damn, I thought I was going to get you the greatest gift. I was like, you did. However, <laughs> this is 25 years in the making. <laughs> so oh there's, God. but uh, yeah, so let's go back to your turtles. Cause that's what we're here for really. Oh no, no problem. Uh, so when, when you were doing all of this stuff, do you remember how long the shoot was for this? Wow. How many sessions did we do? Because um, you know, with animation, you record the voice for a lot of times or most of the time, unless you're dubbing something or, you know, revoicing something from another language or just doing, you know, some dubbing, but you record the voice first mm -hmm. and they animate to the voice afterwards. So we had about, do we have like four or five sessions, four or five full five hour sessions, probably. Yeah, that sounds about right. So maybe about us like 25 hours in the studio together over time, over about a week. And then once we did that, they animated. And then like several months later, you know, many months later, we came back and did dubbing and clean up and additional voice recording. Um, um, so yeah, so it, the whole thing took place over a year, but it was only four or five days for the first chunk and then another three or four days for the second chunk. So faster than you think, our, our part was probably the easiest part to do. Cause again, we're having fun playing in the studio. We're yeah. not worrying about the animation and matching and, you know, color correcting. And it's just, once again, the set design and the, the, the story, um, Kevin Monroe did an incredible job with this, by the way. Uh, and, and, and he became a friend over time over this as well. So yeah, we didn't have as much time in the studio as you would think. Mm -hmm. the, the main magic was done, of course, in the, the creating of the animation, the editing, because I thought the animation on that was um, was beautiful. Yeah, was, was they did a great job. And by the way, a little something a lot of people know. So at the beginning of the movie, when they're hunting for what they call them, the ghost, of, uh, uh, the ghost of the jungle. What, remember the beginning oh, of yeah, the yeah, when they're hunting for Leo? Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I was I was the guy trying to find him. The ghost <laughs> of the jungle. And, you know, and then, of course, I get scared. Not the deals, and I start running away. So I got to play that character as well, in addition to some other stuff. Whenever I watch the movie, I'm like, look, th that's my voice. And I'm like, why are you getting excited? You're like one of the turtles. That, and aren't you excited about this? Go, no, no, I'm excited about that too. But look at him running away. Mother, that's me. 
<laughs> so I got I got excited about this ridiculous, all these extra voices that you do. And that happens in a lot of stuff, because generally when they're paying you to voice something, they also, you, you know, you can do an extra voice for them, which is, you, of course, you gladly do, oh, yeah. you know, whatever you can do to help the show. And so I'll hear a show that I'm on and I'll hear this ridiculous extra little voice. That, oh, that's me. And my kids are like, <laughs> Dad, you're like one of the stars of the thing. I'm like, I know, but that little voice was me. I, I did, this one, and I did so this one and I did that one. <laughs> <laughs> I get a thrill out of that stuff. It's just funny to me. So, yeah, we, we weren't in the studio as long as you might think. The magic, uh, the magic happened a lot without us. Although when they add the voice to everything at the end and edit everything together, I think the final, pro you know, the finished product came out great. I, I really, I was proud of it. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good story. It looked good. Yeah. I, I thought the turtles, you know, I, I, it, cause it, you know, I think there's a certain responsibility that you feel when you take on, and I've said this before, and I've said it also about transformers mm -hmm. um, when you enter that universe. Um, there's a responsibility you feel to sort and, you know, hold that mantle up because it, they're, those, these characters are held in such high regard, you know, yeah. from our childhood, not just, you know, yours and mine, but everyone else that grew up loving these characters, mm -hmm. whether they're reading the books or whether they were, you know, watching the cartoon, watching an animated feature, regardless, people love these characters and they have a place in American folklore. So you sort of feel this responsibility when it's okay, you're going to be done. Oh, I, better not screw this up. I better be one of the good Donnies, one of the ones that they say, oh, I like that Donatello. He was good because everyone has their favorite. Yeah. Everyone has their favorite voice or the one that they relate to the most. They go, oh, I like your version or I grew up with the cartoon originally. So that's the voice that I like. And I watch Nickelodeon now, so I like those guys. So, you know, you feel that responsibility. I want to make sure that people like our version of it. And yeah. I think people did. And I was pretty proud of it, regardless of how it was received. I enjoyed it because I kind of have my own standard where you know what, I, I'm pretty, I could look at something neutrally and go, yeah, I know I was a part of it, but I wasn't, I don't think I did as good a job as, eh, nah, nah. but you look at it and go, okay, if I can walk away feeling like I'm proud of it and I'm, I'm really glad what, how everyone performed and my performance, especially, because that's all I can really control. And I walked away just being overall proud of the entire movie or the other actors and uh, Galen and, you know, Kevin, our director and the right, I mean, everything I thought came out really well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. There's one thing I never, ever look at and at least when it's not something I've done directly. So like a lot of people sit there and say, well, the critics didn't like it or, and this isn't just about the movie, this is about whatever. Critics didn't like right. it or it wasn't acclaimed. Bullshit. I don't give a shit right. when anybody else says, I'm gonna make my own opinion. This movie was fantastic. Don't just take it from me. Don't take it from Mitchell here. Go out and check it out for yourself, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Form your own opinion. <laughs> yeah, this movie is fantastic. Don't sit here and get on the threads. However, I cook for a living. <clears throat> Excuse me. I cook for a living. And if there's one thing I've learned over, excuse me, <clears throat> damn, man, I don't know what it is. I'm getting all choked up. I think I'm hitting no, you're getting choked up talking to me. I understand. Yeah. I have that effect on myself. So I get it. <laughs> I love that, that I love that. I, it's not ego, but it's, I oh, mean, I can't think of that word. I, cause I do the same thing. Like I'll sit there and my wife, I'm usually the person that is self-deprecating. I'm usually the person right. who is if somebody loves my food, I'm pointing out four or five things that I knew I could have did differently to execute right. it to a higher standard. And I always get, eh. but lately I've just started thinking like, I, I enjoy when people tell me they like it, but I like it more when they tell me they hate it because then I know what to change. It's weird. I know, but it makes me get better. I got this weird thing up here. This like, oh man, it doesn't matter how good they think it is. I know it can be better. Right. Fuck their opinion. I'm gonna do what I want to do because I'm gonna make it better, 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 better. Right. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I'm just sitting there and then lately I've just had this, this mentality where like, yeah, no, that's what I do. Right. And then everybody takes me being serious and me being cocky, but it's, it's really not. It's me joking about it because six months, a year ago, I couldn't sit here and be like, yeah, no, but I, it sucks to me. So I, I'm glad you like it, but you know, it sucks. Right. To me, right. But I like seeing that. I, I had a, I had a big part in your childhood. I did this Donatello guy. I did it right. pretty good. Screw what everybody else thinks. I like that. I like that mentality. I like that vibe. Um, when you were talking, it's crazy that it only took four or five sessions and then three sessions later. It, right. When you said sessions, I'm thinking like, oh man, these guys are at least in here 12, 13 hours a day. And you're telling me it's like five hours a day. I'm like, holy shit, they did so much. And what seems like so little, did it seem little or did it seem small? It, it seemed like... <sighs> Now that I'm thinking back, I'm like, maybe, maybe we had some eight hour days and maybe a few of them were eight hour days, but not, not 13 hour days. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it, I think when you're used to doing voice work, you know, that things tend to go fairly quickly, mm -hmm. even when you're doing a feature film that goes faster, especially if you're used to being on camera, 
yeah. and you know how what a grind that process is where generally you'll shoot two or three pages a day mm -hmm. which is why it takes so long so many weeks and sometimes months yeah. to shoot a movie because you know you can you're obsessing over every detail which usually most of which has little to do with the actors and everything mm -hmm. else around it so and more about everything else around it so i wasn't that surprised but a piece of me you, having you know used to being on camera was like huh, how could my how could we be a lead a, a lead in a movie and be done in five or six days it just doesn't seem yeah. right right that's what you're thinking so if you're looking at it from the perspective of what goes into it as an on-camera actor and how much you're a part of that process over a two three four sometimes five month period then yeah it seems like well, what what happened did i get fired i'm gone in five days i can't be right <laughs> so yeah it did seem it seemed very odd yeah. from the voice actor perspective you're like okay yeah, we got it. We got this. It's good. We, we know we did it. And I think I attribute a lot of that to the fact that we came together so quickly as a group, mm -hmm. even with our, with our director, with Kevin. I mean, everything just sort of melded really quickly. Um, and with our voice directors as well. So, I mean, it, it just, I, yes and no, I'm, I'm sort of split as, as an on-camera actor and someone that loves movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised by how short it was, but the voice part of me that does that work felt like it was just right. So yeah, I was, I was two worlds in a world where <laughs> one man has two minds. So yeah. I, so yes or no is the answer by my standing, my, my, you know, my neutral answer is yes, no. Okay. And you said two things that I wanted to circle back to. Sure. One being the animation that you guys not have to match it, but the one that I really wanted to hit on because you, you brought it up a couple of times, the on screen and then the, uh, the voice acting, if you had to choose one, which one are you choosing? Wow. That's really tough. <laughs> I, I will tell you that I've grown to love the voice work more and more. And I didn't have a lot of ego about it when I switched, when I transitioned to doing more voice work than on camera work. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think it was an easy transition is that I realized I can be 17 in an animated feature and still look like this. <laughs> Let's let's leave it at that. Um, I love the freedom of it, especially coming from an industry where you're competing for roles. Sometimes you're going in, you're auditioning, and before you even say word one, you walk into that room. More times than not, they know if they're going to hire you, or I mean, they know if you're even visually right or not. Can you tell that being experienced as you are? Uh, no, I know that they're judging that. You have to sort of let that go when you walk in a room or else you'd be paralyzed and you couldn't do your performance. Yeah. So you sort of know that, that half the, the, the majority of the time you walk in, they're gonna have an idea. Oh, he's too tall, too short, too skinny, too fat, too ethnic, not ethnic enough. Not enough hair, too much hair. I mean, it could be, he looks like someone I used to date, uh, fire him. There's so many things that go into casting that have nothing to do with your performance. Um, so you're used to being judged as an actor by this before you even get to use yeah. your skill set before you get to use your tools you know imagine you go in as a chef and it's like you go in you're ready to do your thing it's like people are like no his beard's like, too you red. haven't even let me take out my knives and do some prep nothing nothing nope you're not our guy it's like wow so if you walk into the room knowing that and thinking about it you can't let you you can't bring that baggage with you or else you'd be paralyzed and never be able to do your thing so in the voice world, this is all coming down. I'm, I'm planting these seeds for a reason. So in the voice world, to not be hindered by that and basically be in a position where if you can sound it, mm -hmm. you can do it. You know, if we're all talking like a bunch of teenagers, like, hey, guys, come on. Yeah. And like, oh, he sounds like a teenager, right? But then I would never be allowed to play that part unless I was the creepy uncle that was trying to be a teenager, which is creepy. <laughs> or the creepy grandfather or father at my age. So I love the freedom of voice work that people that work on that side of the industry are incredibly talented. The writing is just as good, if not better, um, because you're telling a story differently. You're also telling a story with more freedom. Yeah. The world of physics and, you know, as we know them cease to exist. So you can do all sorts of wonderful things. So I've really grown to love the voice work now. Would I go back to doing film and television? Sure. But on a day to day, I love what I'm doing with the voice work right now, just because of that freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the funny part is, I think Hollywood and the Hollywood mentality is catching up in the voice world where stunt casting, you'll see celebrities being cast more and more 
not necessarily because they're the right voice, but because they want a celebrity in that role. That doesn't, this isn't like sour grapes where I'm like, there should be no celebrities. It should just be solid voice. There are some celebrities that are amazing at voice work that are, that are terrific and that deserve everything. But sometimes I think producers get the idea that we need a celebrity in this role. Where most people think in a voice role, most people think when you go to see an animated feature, an animated TV show, you don't know, you don't care. You want it to be funny. You want it to look good, sound good. You want the humor, the writing to be there. You don't care if it's stunt casting or not. Yeah. But I think to this, you know, with Hollywood creeping in, they want to be able to say we have so-and-so in this movie. And with that comes other Hollywood things such as they before, you know, you'd do an audition and, you know, you'd get the role. You wouldn't get the role because the audition was on tape or digital and mm -hmm. they'd have it and listen to it. And that would be your call back. But now it's like we want to bring them back in. We want to meet them before we hire them for this voice role. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, crap. They want to meet me. And normally with a callback, my agent would be like, oh, you usually kill it when you're in the room. What are you worried about? I'm like, I'm not worried about it. But in the voice world, they're used to hearing my voice. If they see me, it's going to ruin the illusion of what they've heard. And maybe they pictured me or they pictured the role looking a certain way or they know what this character looks like in the animation. Yeah. And I match that voice to that animation. But when they see me in person, that, that fantasy is gone. Yeah, They're going to see me in all my years. Mm -hmm. And all my not looking like what they probably imagine that character to look like if they haven't drawn him yet. They're going to so, look at you and go, he's not mid fifties. <laughs> exactly. He's not in his mids. You were selling us someone in his mids, his mid teens. He's clearly out of his mid teens. So that's the one downside that we're starting to see, you know, age and uh, gender and things sort of creep their way, the way that they crept the, you know, creep their way into other things in Hollywood now into the voice world as well. And which is why the voice world was always so neutral in terms of race, age, didn't matter. Yeah. If you could sound that part, you could be that part. I was, it was the most colorblind and age and uh, gender sort of neutral casting that Hollywood ever had because you just had sounding like that character. It didn't matter. And now you're seeing it's starting to matter a little bit. And for us, it's sort of like, ah, that the freedom of being able to just go in and try and win a role based on what you sound like and not have anyone judge you for better or for worse by the exterior. And having lived that life for so long, I'm kind of bummed about that, but hopefully everything will come full circle and we'll see people just being hired on the merits of their voice once again. So that would be a lovely thing. That, that's what, that's what I would love. I want, I don't care who it is for the longest right. time. There's a couple characters and forgive me. I cannot remember their names. I don't have the analytics. I don't have the names up. However, some of my favorite TV shows, Never knew, I believe it was Bart Simpson, was voiced by a woman until they started doing the behind the actors uh, that show they used to do where you would see the entire cast. And then oh, you yeah. had one of my other favorite shows, King of the Hill, Bobby Hill, voiced by a woman. Dexter's Lab. She's a good friend of mine, by the way, Pam Adelon. She's fantastic, but go ahead, yeah. Yes, fantastic. And then you have Dexter's Lab, voiced by a woman. Sadly, she is no longer here. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things cut way too short. Um, but it's, you, you start looking and like, damn, men can play women, women can play men, kids can play adults, adults can play kids. When I found out that, that Rob Paulson, right, one of my favorite voice actors of all time, when I found out that he was still doing the voice of Yakko in the Animaniacs, and he is, I think, 63, 65, somewhere in that range, right? you can still hit that voice. I'm like, crazy, right? Hey. It, it, it's amazing because when I, when I sit back and I listen, because every time I'm done with these interviews, I go back and listen to see where I could have got better, um, where I could have shut the hell up more um, and let you guys talk. Oh, I have notes for you. I'm going to send them to you when we're done, but go I ahead. Appreciate, I appreciate that. Uh, I like getting notes. Imagine if I was such a dick. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. You're perfectly fine, man. Um, but it, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to sit here. I'm going to pull up my email. This is what you could have did better. Page one, two, three. I'm like, damn, he was serious. I should have shut the 19. Bar. Oh, wow. We have age 19. Look We're at still going. What are you reading? I'm, these notes, Mitchell's these notes. I gotta done. I got to see her and take notes on notes, right? <laughs> but it, it's, it's insane. And you saw it back in the 90s where you would have, or even before then, really, you'd have the guys that played in the big pictures and the girls that they wouldn't play in the little pictures, the TV. And now with Netflix and Hulu, everybody that either, you know, shit on TV back in the day or shit on voice acting, everybody's just going wherever because it's work at this point. However, I want the best people in there. There's some voice actors that are, there's some actors that come out there and they've got such a distinct voice, like a Rob Paulson, like a right. Nick Nolte, you know, like insert whoever here. Um, and it's interesting when they go and cast these guys, because some of these guys, 
withstanding the names I said, um, you know, some of these guys have come out and said, I don't want to do, you know, TV. I don't want to do cartoons, but now they're starting to switch it around. You know, um, how, how is it? How do I put this without sounding like a dick? No, go ahead. I'll, I'll try to undickify it in my notes. Too. Go ahead. <laughs> I just, I, I, I get it. Like everybody can backtrack. Everybody can grow. Everybody can evolve and have a different opinion but that's what you want you want to see growth in people you want to see people change their ideas that's why i never sit here and say oh man well he said this 10 years ago but now he's saying this it's completely contradictory i don't give a shit and as long as it's good it's good you know but is it weird seeing these same guys or these same girls and vice versa going from tv to movie movies to tv they come in to your turf your territory right right do you, see, do you get that is it hard to get past some of that stuff not at all and i, I I tell you, because one, and, and again, this is one of the things that I love about the voice world. It's a much more welcoming environment mm -hmm. than on camera film and television ever was. Uh, there's sort of this, uh, there is a, it's, it's a really nurturing atmosphere and I think it's a very accepting atmosphere. And it's funny more times than not, uh, especially when I was doing Transformers Robots in Disguise on Netflix <laughs> now. I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? So I did Transformers Robots in Disguise for four seasons, right? Say it and one more time. Say it one more time. Transformers Robots in Disguise, <laughs> only on Netflix now. Um, so when we did that, we had a lot of stunt casting. And um, more times than not, whenever they bring celebrities or you know some of the heavy hitters in, they would be nervous. Really? Because they knew, it's like, wow, this is not my domain. This is their domain. That they, This is something they do every day. This mm -hmm. is not my domain. And again, when you think about it, and I understand that because, again, having lived on both sides of this, as a film actor, and I use the word tool set a lot because I think it applies, you have a pretty big tool set as a film actor because, yes, you have your voice, you have your face, you have your expression. That's a subtlety of expression and emoting, mm -hmm. right? When you're doing a voice gig, especially when you're not seeing anything there, when you're not matching anything visually, you're not dubbing, where you're just doing the initial record that they animate to that we talked, we talked about earlier. Yeah. You don't have the luxury of having people see your expression to know that you're joking, to know that you're being wry, mm -hmm. to know that you're being, you know, a little subtle jet. Everything has to be heard in the voice. Yeah. So normally a film actor would come in or a television actor comes in, they're used to being able to make a look or like, hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can't do that with animation, with voice work. You have to hear that look. You have to hear that subtlety of innuendo, that subtlety of, oh, here's what he meant by that, without the luxury of being, people, being able to see your expression or your body language. Yes. And that's a different skill set. My voice just cracked unattractively. That's a different <laughs> skill set. Um, and not everybody has that. Uh, so now, granted, the acting is acting. Mm -hmm. I think good actors are good actors, and it transcends film, television, voice work on camera. So the actors that we had coming in were all good actors. And once they got past the nervous part of, wow, I've never, I said, it's the same thing as on camera. In fact, you're, when you're moving, when we're, we're actually recording, usually your arms, you're not supposed to wear crinkly shirts because you can't help it. Your arms are moving, you're, act, you're acting and just in front of a microphone instead of a camera. Once they get past the, oh, it's just acting just in a different way than I'm used to, then everything works out fine. But I think some people are not comfortable in front of a microphone yeah. and do not have the ability to tell a story with their voice where they would normally rely on their expression, their physicality, their mm -hmm. facial expression. So it's not a perfect fit for everyone, but good acting, I think is good acting and you can hear it as well as see it. So for the most part, it, tran it translates really well. Uh, more than anything, I just, it, it's frustrating that the idea is you need a celebrity to make something work. If you wanna cast a celebrity, cast them because that's the person you want. That's the voice that you're passionate about. That's the actor you wanna work with. That's great, go for it. But the idea that you're casting because you think this will bring more people in, I think that comes into play in film on camera because people, you know, people can pull movies just by their face or by name. But in animation, it's not really necessary. But I think the perception is that it is because I still go into things or I'll see an animated film or I'll see an animated TV series and I won't know who's in it. Mm. And I'll love it or I won't love it based on what I hear. Yeah. Right. And it's I think shows are successful based on how they look and how they sound, not who you tell me is doing that voice. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think, again, the obsession with we need to do this rather than we want to do it. If it's a need, that's one thing. But if it's a want, go for it. You know, there are some incredibly talented voice actors that just, ha just happen to be celebrities. And like I said, 
acting, good acting is good acting, but the idea yeah. that you have to do this to make a project work, I think isn't necessarily true. I think it definitely does pigeonhole you guys too, because then you set it up like, oh, this is going to be great because we have him or we have her, but then right. it just falls short. And then you're like, well, you had him, you had her. What, ha what happened in between having him or having her? Why didn't we, why didn't it work? And I mean, you more, not more times. Yeah. Work. It's because they felt they had to do this rather than this is, you know, listen, any, and this, this comes down to, I think, human experience. Mm. How different is your experience when you want to do something versus when you have to do something? Oh, it's like pulling right? teeth. Have to, if, you, if you have to do it, it's like pulling teeth, right? You just, eh. I mean, you have, a, you have a passion for what you do, both here on this side, both in your, in your, as a chef mm -hmm. and as doing this, you have a passion for it. Clearly, you can tell. Yeah. And you can tell when someone has a passion for something, when they want to be doing it, when they're enjoying it <laughs> versus, uh, oh, you need me to do this? All right, let's get this shit over with. Let's, let's go. This shit in. <laughs> you know what I mean? But and it's but it's a totally different approach. Yeah. And there's a totally different product. And there's a, you get totally different result every time. So, yeah, I think you can you can sometimes tell when things don't necessarily match when the pieces don't always match. Yeah. And you can tell in the booth. You can tell you know if you're doing an ensemble record. It hasn't happened that often though. Mm -hmm. In my experience, I've been I've been fortunate where I've worked where I've worked with great people on great shows. And more, you know, many more times than not, it's the right fit. And the people that are brought in that are celebrities are wonderful. Yeah. They're having a great time and they, they do a fantastic job. Because like I always say, acting is acting. But it, it, it does happen sometimes. You could usually tell. Well, I mean, I'm glad. you. Like I said, when you said it best, when it's done right, you can tell. And yeah. there hasn't been anything that I've seen. Uh, what was that show on Netflix you, just, you were just talking about? Do you mean... Transformers, robots in disguise. That's I one. even gave you my best creepy promo voice. Wasn't that <laughs> creepy? Is that is that the is that the weird uncle or the weird grandpa you were talking about that you're trying out for? Is that that voice? No, no, no. Cre creepy announcer guy is totally different. He's oh, yeah? very upsetting, but for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but I got to tell you, when those do we have another minute? Are we okay? Yeah, we're perfectly fine. Okay. Whenever those voice gigs would come up, mm -hmm. where it was like typical announcer guy. Now yeah. available at Ralph's only two ninety nine. Or does it? And it had like cheesy, pure cheese announcer back when it was okay. To, now it's like everything's really natural. And they just want natural sounding people. I don't think they realize what natural sounding people sound like sometimes. They want a yeah. professional to sound natural. But yeah. um, whenever it was like a super cheesy, I get so, oh, I get to do cheesy announcer guy. I love that. It's just <laughs> such a joy. You know, you get to put on that great thing in your voice where you could sound super cheesy. And I just love that. I don't know why. So yeah, he's creepy, but for a totally different way. Uh, <laughs> a totally different reason, I mean, yeah. I, I can dig it. So we are getting towards the end, unfortunately. However, you've always got an open invitation to come back anytime you want. But I always like to kind of start wrapping it up with a few of the same questions, but they're always some kind of different iteration of the same question. Sure. At the end of the day, when you sit back and you look, you've had Robots in Disguise on Netflix exclusively. You've had Stan Rothstein. You've had Donatello. And we didn't talk about it. I guess I'm a huge cartoon fan and you got to do the voice of Norbert on Angry Beavers for the pilot. I loved this cartoon. However, I recently just watched the pilot and I watched a couple episodes of the first one. I like your voice better for Norbert than I did Thank you. the guy that got Norbert. Um, I think you would have been a great dag too, if we're being completely honest. You've got that, <laughs> zany, that zany feel. Um, uh. But when it all comes down to it, right? You got robots in disguise. You've got Stan. You've got Donnie. Which one is like slipping on a pair of sandals or slipping on your shoes? Which one just feels right? Oh, oh it's tough, ain't it? <laughs> oh yeah, that's the toughest one. Uh, wow. They they all feel like different parts of me, so they all feel very natural to me, even though a lot of the voices are different. But I think I think Donnie's probably the closest to home. Mm -hmm. just because of his mentality and just how everything was sort of thought out and a little methodical. Um, let's go with Donatello. Cause I also think that would give you joy. Yeah. Let's go with Donatello. <laughs> hey, like, like I said, man, I, I, there's, this is why this thing is called what's in my head. Cause as you <laughs> notice, we'll go off on all these different tangents, but I love we it. always come back to here. Name came up with by my wife. We were actually listening to the cranberries um and then zombie came on and it was what's in your head what's in your head and that type of shit i can't sing my voice is horrible so i don't want to sit here and burn your ears out you know 
Um, but she was, she slapped me in the arm. She's like, that's what you should name it. And I was like, cause we were trying to come up with a name. It was, I didn't want to keep it just super cartoony where it was, people would look at it and like, oh, man, I don't want to talk about cartoons. I want to talk about whatever. Right. And then she was like, you know, you're, you go off on all those weird ass tangents talking and stuff. And then she just shook her head. She, you would look at her and you're like, do you love me? And I know she does. And she always does it with, with, with such, with such love and affection and shit. And she always, and Hey, she got you those turtles by the way. So damn right. And she, nobody got stabbed for it, especially me, which is always a great thing. Um, but you know, she, she came up with, with the idea and she's like, you know, you're always going off on these weird tangents and then, you know, you just name it that I think that'll be good. So I was like, Oh man, I started thinking that'd be good. Um, so with the voices that are in your head, right. Hey, yeah. You said Donatella was the easiest one to slip into. Out of right. everything you've done, what's been the hardest one you've had to come up with? Uh, that was that would be Phobos for Witch. There was um, a Disney series years ago called Witch. That's W period, I period. Um, it was like a supernatural thing. And believe it or not, I was the ultimate evil in the universe, mm -hmm. which you hear me talking and it's hard to imagine because I don't sound like the most evil person. I don't have that super deep voice. You got a mechanical um, voice. I got to say, I'm, I'm feeling pretty creeped out. And it's got an oh, evil sense to it, you know? <laughs> thank you. I, I am. I, well, you know, I'm the king of creep. I'm in my, my mids. So um, I had, I don't know how familiar you are with a lot of these voice guys, um, but D. Bradley Baker, mm -hmm. again, one of the most talented voice actors in the business and does every creature like, <sighs> like these incredible snarling. He's amazing. He's a yeah. really gifted actor as well, but his, the command of his voice and he gets these sounds to come out of him. So he was one of my henchmen and Steve Bloom, who mm -hmm. was also, you should look Steve Bloom up. He is amazing. He has this great, deep, rich voice. Mm -hmm. So the idea that they were my henchmen and I was the evil bad guy. And so I had to find this sort of different way of speaking where I could use a different tone in my voice and just a different, a different measure of speaking, different rhythm and a different tone and it was hard because when I first got the job, they're like, okay, now we want you to sound like really deep voice. Really, I was like, you hear my voice, right? You know that I'm not Orson Welles, right? You hear, this is me. So we're kind of limited in how far I can go. You don't want to tune this. So um, we found, eventually found this voice for him. That was truly, it's like a mix of like creepy, it's like a creepy voice uh, announcer guy mixed with the creepy uncle together and <laughs> Phobos was born but it wasn't my natural voice or my natural delivery. So it took a while to get into that and to find it. And I think probably for the first few episodes, we were still trying to find it. But once it got locked in, it's like, yes, now I have it. But that was by far the toughest one because it was the furth furthest from my normal tone, let alone my normal pacing and normal delivery. So Phobos from which that's an easy answer. All right. So I've had so much fun doing this, man. I, like, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. You could have been doing anything just like you guys. You guys could have been doing anything other than this. And you chose to do this. And I can't thank you enough. Um, is there anything that you're working on that you can talk about? Anything, books, movies, anything that you can kind of direct towards? Where can people find you at? Oh, wow. People, you know, people can still find. I think what's uh, what's still on the air right now? Oh, uh, Vampirina for Disney is still on the air. So if you have kids, if you have young kids that are watching Vampirina, I played Demi the Ghost on that. I've been on that. I was on that one for several years, and that one's still going on right now. You know, with COVID and everything, things have been slowing down. Things are going to be picking up toward the end of the year. Um, can't really talk about stuff yet because stuff is still kind of new. Mm -hmm. But uh, look forward to stuff in the upcoming year. But right now, I have to tell you, uh, I'm trying to make lemonade out of the lemons we've been given for the last six, seven months, and yeah. enjoy the time with my family, enjoy the time with my kids. They're getting older. And uh, every meal I get to have with them, every time they get to stay out and don't want to be with their friends and stay home with us, I'm thrilled. So I'm enjoying the hell out of being a dad right now, working way again until the beginning of next year. Well, hey, man, I mean, you, you're doing you're doing it right. Right. So thank you. Um, like I said, thank you again. I, I had a lot of fun with this. Hopefully you guys did, too. This has been. Oh, hold on. Since you've got. Uh, since you've got some time until the end of the year and we're only, you know, hopefully we're only two months away from the end of the year. And when yes. December, whatever it ends with 30, 31st, hopefully we don't get a December 32nd or a 2020 part two. Cause I am sick and tired of this shit. Yeah, we're done. Um, yeah. It needs to go back to some sort of normal. However, I think you've got the making of a book and you can call it my mids or something along those lines. And you could write this book. I know I it's have to give you credit for it. 
Ah, you don't have to give me credit for shit. I'm just sitting here talking to you. That's all the credit I need. I had fun. I got to talk to somebody that I watched on the big screen and the big screen one was animated. One was real life. I mean, when you really think about it, I was hoping the turtles were real life. This got close. So who's this? Who's to say they are not? I mean, uh, you know, I, I've never seen a mutant ninja turtle, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. So always remember that. And also, I wanted to thank you for having me. And uh, for anyone else that's thinking of doing this show, you need to do it because it's a blast. I appreciate you taking the time. And listen, when people enjoy, and like when you realize, and I think a lot of actors realize this, some don't, um, people really enjoy the finished product of what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think just to be able to sit and talk about it on a more human level and, and sort yeah. of humanize a lot of the stuff that we do, get some inside information about the experience, about making these projects, it's really fun. It's fun for us to reminisce about the, the projects that we worked on. And I think it's fun for you and fun for the listeners to try and find, you know, the viewers to try and find, oh, wow, there is like a human element to everything that goes into the things that we see on TV and in the movies. And it's an important thing to remember. So we appreciate it as actors. And I appreciate you taking the time to want to know more about it because God knows, as you can see, I could talk about this forever. There's that creepy guy again. Damn it. Well, I mean, between Creepy Guy and Transformers, you've got it knocked down. And one more time, where can they find Transformers at? You gotta have the Transform rule. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you mean Transformers Robots in Disguise? I believe it's on Netflix now. I think that's what it was. And there's no better way to find out where you can find Mitchell. You saw how the sausage was made, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mitchell. I appreciate it. You have a great time. Thanks, man. <laughs> Give your kids a big old hug. Tell them you love them. Same thing goes for you guys. Thank you again. And I hope to have you on soon. Thanks, man. Me too. No problem. Take it easy, brother. I'll talk to you soon. All right. You got it. This podcast was presented by the Epic Sewers Podcast Network, the home of all your pop culture podcast needs. With shows like Epic Tales, Epic Tales from the Sewer, the Spoiler Force Podcast, Creator Con Q&A, Comic Watchers, and the What's in My Head Podcast. Follow us on this journey and get down and nerdy as we bring you the best in pop culture.